Good afternoon again. It's Julie Newberry here with Covenant House Toronto for our second installment of our Facebook Live series. It wouldn't be Facebook Live if we didn't have some technical difficulties, so I appreciate you uh, hanging tight there. Um, uh, if you joined us last month where we were commemorating uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Day, uh, Bruce Rivers and I were here talking about the realities of sex trafficking here in our country, in our city, in our province. Today we're joined by Carolee Wiseman and uh, Elisa Simpson to uh, talk to you about uh, supporting survivors uh, and the work that we do here frontline to support survivors of sex trafficking. Carolee Wiseman is a shift supervisor with our crisis shelter here at the agency. And Elisa Simpson is a registered nurse, but is also the manager of our healthcare team. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Yeah, lovely to have you here. This is going to be uh, really quite quite mm -hmm. nice to have you both with us. Um, so this is a uh, second installment of a five-part series here that we're doing on the issue of sex trafficking. If you go to our Facebook Live page, which you probably already are if you're watching us now, you will be able to look at the uh, installment that Bruce and I did. Uh, the next installment will be on April the 26th, which will look at prevention and interruption of sex trafficking through the simple fact of dialogue and having conversations around the issue. So uh, enjoy the rest of your time with us today and please continue to log in and uh, and keep track of the uh, the other uh, segments that we're doing so we are here with you for the next 30 minutes uh, and we welcome any questions that you happen to have we are also joined by Tracy LeBlanc who is our director uh, associate director of communications here there is her hand and half her face welcome Tracy thanks for your help um, so Tracy will be uh, fielding all the questions that you uh, submit to us throughout the next little while with us. She'll volley them over to us and we'll do our very best to answer them as they, as they arrive. So without further ado, I'm going to dig into some of our questions here. Um, Carolee, do you mind if I, if I go to you first? Sure. Okay, right on. So I'm hoping, Carolee, that you can talk to our viewers about uh, our two crisis beds here at the agency. Sure. Um, some of our young ladies can access our safe beds. Uh, they will come in either through victim services. Uh, police may bring them in. Uh, young people may find out about our beds through school, um, sometimes through their uh, guidance counselors, through friends, uh, through other important people in their lives that they've chosen to trust in that moment who are aware of our services. Uh, young ladies can come in and access our beds 24 hours a day. Uh, they do come in uh, through uh, an intake pr uh, process. Uh, during the intake process, we will uh, email Julie and her team and let them know that we've had uh, a new intake. And uh, through that process, they will then be connected to the other services here at Covenant House, whether that be uh, further services uh, being victimized, um, you know, through, through the HT team, they're able to connect to those services. If they wanted to streamline a little bit more and uh, they could attend one of our school programs, they could attend our housing programs, um, you know, there's there's so much of a variety of programs available here at Covenant House, not just for um, uh, the other youth that are in program, but uh, specifically for our HT girls as well. What yeah. makes this program <clears throat> unique? I think the fact that all of our services, whether it's healthcare, mm -hmm. whether it's your team, whether it's the frontline staff, we're all connected. And um, <clears throat> our main focus really is that young person coming into program and whatever we can do to um, access supports for that young person, whether it's in Covenant House or outside of Covenant mm -hmm. House, we all just flow with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have a really good connection between the departments. Um, I know that on a regular basis, I'm, you know, calling Elisa mm -hmm. to, you know, discuss things and, you know, hey, I, I need help here, or reaching mm -hmm. out to your team. And, you know, it, it's just how well we work together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's, it's, so important when when the young ladies are leaving and they're saying how much they've appreciated mm -hmm. that uh, that connection. I have a question for you, Carolee. Sure. So, if a young person uh, presents to Covenant House looking for shelter and they identify with having a human trafficking background, but the safe beds are full, what happens to them, and can they still access our human trafficking services? Okay. That's a that's a great question, actually. Um, so, we do have um, thirty six beds available on our female identified floor. Mm -hmm. And if we do have a bed available, um, then what we would do is we would do an intake for that young person in one of those 36 mm -hmm. beds. Um, but again, giving a heads up both to your department as well as Julie's department and uh, just letting you know that there is a young person who has identified uh, human trafficking and uh, would like to, to meet with, uh, with both right. of your teams. And then we would move forward from there. And then um, depending on the circumstance or the situation, it may de be determined 
determined that the young person is better served at one of the other houses um, in in the program and, and I'll let Julie explain those houses uh, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I, I just want to take pause here um, and and note that if you are watching or if someone you know isn't that you think that they may be involved in human trafficking or that they are being sexually exploited uh, in our preamble prior to our live feed uh, Tracy uh, wonderfully put up um, a couple of resources for people um, so you can call 911 if there's an immediate uh, risk or immediate danger you can call your local division uh, if you have suspicion you can call crime stoppers um, if you are uh, a young woman or a young man who is fleeing or exiting hoping to speak to somebody about your experience um, you can call us uh, if you wanted to have access to our uh, our safe beds here um, you can call the main intake line which is a 24 7 open intake and you can call 416-593-4849 Similarly, if you are living in the community and not quite ready to have a face-to-face -face conversation with anybody you're not quite ready to exit, um, then you can also go to uh, uh, 211 Toronto. City of Toronto has an information line uh, that they uh, have people on the line answering their calls who can give uh, information about referrals, um, access to money, access to housing, etc. Um, we also have a, uh, an anonymous, anonymous email, which is nht at covenanthouse.ca. So if you're just calling for a friend, if you're calling for a niece, if you're calling for a nephew, you can always uh, reach out through all of these different ways. So I just wanted to make sure that we got that out today. Elisa. So I wanted you uh, to talk to uh, to people today about your healthcare team and specifically how they support survivors of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So hello everyone. Um, as Julie mentioned earlier, my name is Elisa. I'm a registered nurse in the healthcare clinic here at Covenant House, um, and I'm also the manager of the healthcare clinic here. Um, so what makes our clinic unique in general compared to traditional clinics or healthcare services that you'd receive in the community is that we tried. We are specifically for youth, so 16 to 24 that identify as homeless, at risk or sexually trafficked. Um, what makes us unique is that we don't require um, any ID or health insurance. Um, that's really important for our young women who are escaping these human trafficking situations because oftentimes they leave just with the clothes that they have on their back and whatever they had in their pockets and oftentimes they don't have their insurance or their ID. So we want them to know that there are no barriers to receiving health care in our clinic. They can come and we'll meet them as they are and where they're at and help them through their journey. Uh, what's really important about the healthcare that we provide in our clinic um, is that it's called trauma-informed healthcare. So we know that people that come to our clinic um, have suffered lots of trauma in a lot of different ways, whether that's physical, psychological, social, emotional, um, and we try to build a lot of safety into the work that we do. Um, so with these young women, um, anytime, even if it's to take a temperature to check their heart rate, we're always asking for permission, um, explaining why we need to touch their body and what that purpose is and doing it in a way that's very respectful of their bodies um, because oftentimes they haven't felt respected of, with their bodies. Um, in the clinic, we also prioritize relationship building. So we know that sometimes um, trust takes a lot of time. So we, we see people for, for who they are as a whole person. So we're asking them questions about um, their life beyond just their health and we're getting um, to meet their basic needs first when they come in. So if they need to eat, if they haven't eaten in some time, if they need to sleep, because oftentimes these young women don't get much sleep in the line of work that they're in. And if that's what they need first, that's what we'll give them first and then we'll take care of the healthcare needs after. It sounds, uh, yes, Tracy, is there a question? We want yeah. to thank Joyce and Diana for their comments. Hey, and Joyce, Diana, thank absolutely. Thank you for your, uh, for your being a part of uh, our afternoon today and for your, uh, for your comments. Thanks, Tracy, for that. Um, so I, it, I, I appreciate, I know the, the work that you do at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at healthcare, um, and I know how very unique it is. Um, what happens if a young person... Um, is not residing in one of our safe beds and who is in our uh, general population at the shelter and hasn't identified any interface with sex trafficking or sexual exploitation and comes to your team, a member of your team, um, not having said explicitly that this has happened. Right. Is there a process around that? So it is something that happens quite often um, in our clinic. Of course, we deal with teenagers, 16 to 25. So sexual health is a, um, a major concern for this age group. So we're often doing a lot of um, sexual health teaching, um, screening, um, prevention, things like that. So when we're asking questions around um, their relationships, safety, consent, sometimes basic things like do um, 
do you give permission when you have sex with people? Are people asking your permission before they have sex with you? Are you wanting to engage in these sexual activities? Um, and sometimes just based on the answers that we get, it might raise some red flags to us that suggest that they could either be um, at risk for sexual trafficking or in fact engaged um, in, the, in the sexual trafficking wor world and might need some more uh, specialized help, which is when we would uh, suggest that they meet with Julie and her team who are the experts in this area. Um, and then we would do a warm handoff. So it's nice at Covenant House, we have a lot of services in one building. So our shelter where Carolee works, the healthcare clinic where I work, and the human trafficking services where Julie works, we're all in the same building. So instead of um, just giving them a name and a location that they can go meet Julie, I can actually walk them over and hand them off to Julie. So um, it, it makes it for a, a tight journey. Um, I resist, and I think that my staff, and although I appreciate it, we resist the moniker of experts. The young people are the experts in their journey, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, and we've adapted our language over the mm -hmm. course of working with this population since 2013 um, to let uh, the young women that we work with help us uh, learn. We learn from them every day in, in the work that we do. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you if... Do they have to do anything once there's a disclosure? Uh, once a once a young person, uh, Carolee, I'll, I'll ask mm -hmm. you. Once once you learn, let's say for example, that a young woman uh, is engaged in 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 sex work or is being trafficked, or you feel that she's being trafficked, what are the steps? I mean, is there is there is there anything that you must do? Is there anything that you do? Can it just be a conversation? That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo one of our counselors. I was speaking to them today, and she said the the giving of information is a privilege and not a right so i think we have to honor the fact that this young person has trusted us in the moment and again like like elisa was saying we meet them where they're at mm -hmm. and if all that they're willing to say that day is i'm involved in in being trafficked then that's where we stop and as they decide to open up further and further as we build that relationship um then we take the information and we go with where we're able to go with them mm -hmm. so if it's I'm comfortable in meeting with healthcare yeah. today because I want to talk about something I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. If it's, I, I think I might be being trafficked and I'm not really sure what that looks like mm -hmm. and how it started, I think I might want to talk to somebody on Julie's team. Yeah. It could be a month of I just leave me alone. Yeah, I yeah. just want to yeah. process what's yeah. gone on with my body and with my mind and I don't want any help. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. You know, we would, you know, look at that as a wellness stay. Right. So we're mm -hmm. building that young person up to a point where they're feeling well enough to move forward. Yeah. So one of the nice things about our work here at Covenant House is we follow young people from 16 until 25, uh, whether they're living in shelter, whether they're living in one of the HT related programs or whether they're living anywhere in the community. So it really gives us time uh, to build those relationships over the long term. And like Carolee was saying, if somebody's not ready for a day, a week, a month, even a year, as long as they feel safe enough to come to us whenever they're ready to start having a conversation and to embark on that journey, we're there for them. I think uh, that's a, a critical piece to the work that we do is recognizing uh, where the young person is in terms of their, uh, their life, their choices. We often talk about something called the stages of change uh, and we meet that young person exactly where they are. It's not a linear process of healing. It's not a linear process of, of, of leaving uh, or acknowledging that uh, sexual exploitation is happening in their lives. Uh, and so we continually meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're fortunate enough here at the agency to be able to mirror that journey with them with a lot of our services. So it begins with um, the supports that Carolee and your team are, are, are offering in our crisis beds mm -hmm. in the shelter program. It continues with uh, health care uh, and the services that, uh, that your team offers. Um, the work with the advocates. I have a team of advocates who work with young people in the community who may never uh, enter into our agency, may never receive any of our uh, residential programs but whom the uh, advocates continue to support as they uh, walk through the world, uh, get housing for the first time, maintain housing, parent for the first time. Um, and then uh, as you, you, I think you, you mentioned, Carolee, is that if the young women, after a, a period of stay in the crisis beds, uh, has, a, ha, has a desire to continue the relationship with coming in house and wants a different form of uh, housing, she has the option of uh, applying for one of our two residential programs. Mm -hmm. uh, Avdel Home opened in uh, November of last year and is a uh, community house for young women who are in uh, immediate uh, need of housing. Uh, there are uh, the option of six young women coming to stay in this home. The place is staffed 24-7 with uh, very skilled uh, youth workers. 
have access to our mental health counselor, mental health and substance abuse counselor here at the agency. And again, as they're living in this space, can always have access back to healthcare and all the other services that uh, that uh, my colleagues here have noted. Uh, if they are further along in their stages of change and their uh, willingness and wanting to stay in a program a little bit longer, uh, they have the option of uh, applying for the Rogers Home Program, uh, which is a two-year transitional home. Uh, so the same young women can apply, uh, but with a desired uh, outcome of staying uh, in a housing for uh, for up to two years. And again, it's staffed 24-7, um, and there's six young women who can live in this space and be supported with all the, the, the various um, supports that uh, we can uh, uh, cloak around them. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask the both of you, uh, is there anything specific that you have learned uh, through working with survivors uh, over the past few years, and this could be on a professional level mm -hmm. or on a personal level. Carolee? Oh, sorry, you had something. Go ahead. Right. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I think for me, it's just um, being in amazement of the strength mm -hmm. from a person at such a young age. And, you know, the, the journey that, that they've had to endure before they come to our doors. And, you know, I've, I've met women that are 60 and 70 years old who haven't been through a fraction of what these young women have been through <clears throat> and you see them and you know just the other day I saw a young lady who you know came in fairly recently and within a matter of months she's been able to turn things around mm -hmm. and every time she sees me she speaks about how proud she is from moving do you remember where I was Carolee when you met me and you know now she's moving into you know uh, uh, another place and uh, she's moved forward and she's been able to get the services and I mean just to see her she just glows you know it's a different it's a different person so it's kind of reflective of you know not just the services that we offer but uh, you know just how resilient and strong these young girls are mm -hmm. you know yeah mm -hmm. thank you to Terry for commenting <laughs> Um, one thing that's always, um, that I, that I, I feel that I've learned and is so special to me about this work is going back to this idea of relationships being so central and trust building being so central in this work. Um, you really learn to uh, value a lot of the small wins that happen along the way. Um, sometimes the journey can take a long time, um, but certain things like having a young woman come in scared and, and, and quite abused both physically, emotionally, psychologically. Oftentimes they can't even look you in the eyes when they're talking to you. And then you'll notice you'll encounter them in the kitchen. Cause like I said, the healthcare clinic is um, embedded into the rest of the shelter. So I'll sometimes go into the kitchen and see what the young folks are up to for lunch. And they'll look at you, they'll say hi, they make eye contact. And just knowing that you've, able, you've been able to build trust with somebody, um, it really lays the groundwork for, um, in, in terms of healthcare for them seeking all the additional services that they're gonna need. Um, I, I, Absolutely uh, mirror what you guys are saying in terms of uh, the relationship and the rapport. Um, I think that's one of the things that uh, Covenant House does really well mm -hmm. um, is that uh, is that relationship building um, and and working with this population. And that's one of our greatest tools in the toolkit is that development of the rapport, the relationship. Uh, the advocates have young women with whom they've worked and continue to work for five plus years. Um, as they meet them for the first time, meet them through the crisis bed, yeah. uh, support them in the community, uh, support them in their um, interaction with the court and the legal system, which can be laborious and frightening and not always um, pleasant to deal with. So standing beside them as they, uh, as they do a victim impact statement uh, are a victim witness in a court case, and then uh, staying with them on the other side of all of this as they, um, move into their own communities and try to lay the ground of their of their lives uh, and are available for them um, when when the need be yeah. on the topic of uh, relationship building not only um, with staff and the young people that we work with but even among staff um, as Carolee was saying and Julie was saying we're all available for consult with each other um, we all have sort of specialties in different areas myself healthcare Carolee on the front lines in residential and Julie um, on the front lines with the human traffic anti-human trafficking services um, so I oftentimes have the youth workers uh, calling the clinic from either the, the specialized homes for the human trafficking um, young ladies, if they're not feeling comfortable enough to come into the clinic, I can give them a consult over the phone, that's not a problem at all. Or if Care Lee has noted that there's a young person in shelter who she's concerned about, but that they might not be ready to physically come into the healthcare clinic, um, we can consult with Care Lee and give her some tips on how to best serve them, even if they don't want to interface with healthcare just yet. Yeah. Um, 
Is there anything that either of you want people to know, our audience to know, uh, about this issue? A lot, but yeah. yeah. Well, I think the one thing I want people to know, and it seems so basic, but that it is happening. Um, I found that in being so embedded in this work, um, having worked at Covenant House for the past five years, and as Covenant House becomes um, a national leader in this area, um, I've gotten so so familiar with it, it being a thing that's happening in our in our city in our country um, and I find in my personal life when I talk about it not a lot of people are aware that it that it's happening so I just want people to know that this is this is a very significant issue that's happening right here where we live thank you um, I think for me it's um echoing uh, what Elisa is saying and and also having people realize it's not like what you see in the movies it's not pretty woman it's not Julia Roberts who's making a choice every day to you know, shop in fancy mm -hmm. stores and, you know, meet wonderful people who take her to amazing places. Um, the realness is that it's dirty and it's hurtful and it's horrific. And I think that's why as a team, when we see a young lady come in and she is broken and she doesn't know where to go and she doesn't know who to trust, that the small successes, you know, being able to sit beside someone, being able to let someone move without flinching or, mm -hmm. you know, moving even further, you know, to, to being able to get a job or to go to school, those may be small successes to others. But I think when, when we have a real understanding of how broken these young women are and the impact of trafficking on them, to see them make those progresses. Mm -hmm. It's so much more of a celebration than say people would understand. And, and I think people need to recognize that, that it does happen and uh, it's, you know, it is real. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I agree that uh, one of the reasons that we continue to do these Facebook Lives is to uh, continue to raise awareness uh, amongst our, 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 our donor base, uh, the general public. Um, and to continue to bring to light that this is a, an issue uh, and, and, and the issue that we're talking about is exploitation, uh, that uh, for the most part the young women that we work with uh, are being exploited, that they are involved in sex trafficking uh, against their will. Um, and so that's uh, that's a profound difference that I just wanted to uh, to make sure that was was clear. Um, I want to also take a, a moment to acknowledge our viewers today, uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're going to be watching this taped. Uh, I want to acknowledge your support and your interest in the topic. I want to uh, thank you for your support of the work that we do here at Covenant House Toronto, uh, because we could not do it without you. Uh, the services that uh, my colleagues uh, and I are describing to you uh, are uh, are done with your financial support. So through your volunteer, through your actual uh, fiscal support, continued and ongoing uh, participation in all of our different fundraising events. Uh, thank you from uh, the bottom of our hearts uh, for your continued support in the work that we do. Um, five minutes, thanks very much. I was just wondering that. Um, so we, we would, in all of this, it sounds like, like we're doing a lot, but I, I, I wanna just talk about some of the challenges that, that uh, that, that we as an organization face and other service providers face in the city of Toronto uh, to support survivors. Um, can you guys quickly talk about um, some of those challenges that, that you would face in supporting a survivor? Uh, not necessarily what they would face, but as a, as a service provider? Okay, the, the, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if this is exactly um, the answer uh, maybe that, that we were looking for, but I know there are times when we are supporting the young women and they may decide to go back to the trafficker mm -hmm. and then they'll come back to the shelter and then they go back to the trafficker. And I know that for some people, there's not that understanding of why they're doing that, you know, and then you have to, you know, kind of discuss that, that cycle of violence and, you know, that feeling of comfortability. And as much as we're here to support and offer that unconditional love and, and the covenant and, and all of that, there's a, there's a familiar piece back on the street. Mm -hmm. And when things get uncomfortable here, that's where they're going to go. And sometimes it takes three or four, five or six, seven or eight stays mm -hmm. for them to realize that, you know, that they... Well, it's not a one offer. It's oh, no. Continued. Exchange. Continued. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think for, for some people in the field, they don't necessarily understand that. And, and it's, it's hard for them to watch the heartbreak because you know that that young person is going back to a very unsafe uh, environment and you know you're gonna see them again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and very then when they come back, absolutely, absolutely. So it's like, come on back, 
we're here again. Where are we starting today? And, you know, are we leaving? Are we starting from where we left off before? Or do we need to go back a little bit? You know, um, and, and I think that's one of the difficulties, too. I mean, it's heartbreaking. But once you understand why and you understand, you know, they'll be back. They'll be back. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have so many success stories of young women that, you know, we just thought we're going to continue in that circle. And they finally made a stance for themselves and said, no, I, I want better. I deserve better. And, you know, they, they've been able to kind of, you know, push themselves and, and attain goals that, you know, even were, wow, you know, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Look what you've done. You know, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier in the clinic, we see uh, young women who might be living at Covenant House or Covenant House affiliated programs, but they could also be um, living somewhere in the community. And I think what's always hard is if somebody uh, comes into the clinic to see us and we want to get them connected to a shelter bed because they're ready to leave the situation that they're in, or we want to get them connected to the specialized um, uh, anti-human trafficking homes and that there's no beds available sometimes just because there are so many young people in the city of Toronto in need of a safe place to stay. And Covenant House sometimes is we're, we're maxed out and we just can't take people anymore and sometimes it feels like there's no safe places no safe alternatives where we can send people because um, it's hard for anybody to find uh, affordable rent in the city and a lot of shelters are full all of the time so that's why we need donations and we need shelter beds to be funded because that stuff it's so important when somebody um, especially with these young women when they come in and they're finally you know ready to leave their situation they're ready to make some changes and and have a safe a safe place to go at the end of the day it's heartbreaking when you have to tell them that you just don't have space for them today that's, that's absolutely. Um, since opening up the two crisis beds in October of 2015, we have provided provided housing within these two beds to 87 young women. Um, so their exam, housing is an absolute need. So I, I, I suspect we're probably at one minute uh, to uh, to end our time with you this afternoon. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Kara Lee and uh, Elisa for uh, joining me here this afternoon. To uh, Tracy and all the other people in the room for your uh, technical support and making this uh, a, a happening thing. Check out our Facebook page for our past and uh, keep your eye on our future posts uh, for the next installments. Like I said, it'll be on April the 26th and it will be uh, reducing, the in, uh, pardon me, reducing the risks and incidences of sex trafficking through dialogue. So thank you again for joining us and have a lovely afternoon.